define these concepts for Langevin systems. Uh, I have chosen a single particle, a single degree of freedom. We had discussions afterwards. I should stress that everything I told you holds true for n interacting degrees of freedom. So there can be several particles in a field suspension, for instance, and all that I've told you will be true for these cases as well. So when I entered this field, which was basically five years ago, um, Jarzynski's paper started me, but then I thought, how to generalize this to biophysical systems, because that's my background. And this is the story I'd like to tell you about today. I've already uh, shown this slide in the first lecture. On the left-hand side, you have this incredibly small uh, molecular machine, it's the smallest rotor on Earth, the F1 ATPIs, and I've pointed out that from my perspective, essentially all cellular biology is a smart combination collection of such little machines which act upon external stimuli. But as a physicist, this is essentially just a bunch of these machines. Okay, so before we do the biochemical systems, I'd like to tell you how you generalize this to an arbitrary stochastic dynamics. <coughs> so I guess most of you have a system of Many of you will have systems which can be described by stochastic dynamics, and I'd like to invite you to take these concepts and apply them to your particular system. And I will illustrate these ideas then with a few examples, uh, and then in the second part of the lecture, I will focus on these biochemical systems. That's the idea. So what is stochastic dynamics on a discrete set of states? You have a set of states, N and M, and we have rates for jumping between them. Now these states could be internal states of a protein, could be the number of the species in a chemical reaction network, could also be just discretized spatial coordinates. So you see that the Longinat case is included here. So this is more general, it includes the Longinat case. And you know, you can make up of your own set of states for your preferred physical systems. I will allow that these weights hand on time through an externally given protocol, lambda of form. Then the probability to be at time tall in state n is given by this master equation, or the time dependence of this probability is given by this master equation. <laughs> Let's assume we can solve this equation. There are techniques how to do that. We probably Royce has talked about this a little bit. So this solution will, of course, depend on specified initial conditions. Okay. Now, it's a general theorem that if you fix the rate, there is typically, as long as the network is reasonably well connected, there is a unique stationary solution for any given fixed lambda. So however the initial conditions are, the rates are time independent, you are sure you to run into the stationary solution. Now you have to distinguish two cases. It might be that the stationary solution obeys the dependent balance condition. That's a special case. In this case, you can the ratio of the rates will define energy differences, or you can also just define the energy, the energy of each state n basically as minus the log of the stationary distribution. So once we have that, we can take this as a definition, and for those cases where this detailed balance condition holds, which you can easily check once you have solved it, or you use uh, the techniques introduced by Royce, then you can reasonably well talk about energy. The more interesting case, of course, is the one where in the stationary state you have persistent cycle current, so this theta balance condition is not fulfilled for all pairs of states, and that's what we call the genuine mass. Not a critical state. Okay. So just for illustration, a stochastic trajectory n of tau will look like this. So suppose you have four states, our system will stay for a while, the state then it will jump, and then it will jump to here, and so on. So that's the idea of a stochastic trajectory on this set of states. Okay. And again, I come to my main point. 
In a time dependent situation, this would be the appropriate definition of an ensemble. This is just summed over P, L, and P over all states. And if that probability is time dependent because either the rates are time dependent or because we have started not from the stationary initial condition, that capital S of tau is a reasonable definition. Now, my point is that you can write this ensemble quantity as a non equilibrium average over quantity little s of tau, which is defined in such a way, and I presumably should be a little bit more careful in the notation and write little s of n of tau defined as minus dog e subscript. So Pn of Pn of R is the solution of the master equation. Once you have found the solution, you can take this back trajectory, plug that in here, and can get something which is time dependent through the trajectory in this manner. So this is the definition. Okay? This is the definition. It depends on the entire trajectory up to time. No. Okay, I want to illustrate this here. Okay. I want this is an important point. Okay, this, this quantity, as I will show you, knows about two things. It knows about the ensemble from which the particular trajectory has been drawn. And that's the reason why I can still call it n. Knows about the ensemble, as does the capital S, but it also knows about the individual trajectory um, along which I evaluate its time dependence. I want to illustrate this here. Three states. But that look here on the left hand side these are three states, I specify the rates, and this I've chosen two trajectories. I have specified initial states such that initially we almost always start in state one. The yellow trajectory is a, is a possible one, and the green one, uh, the red one. The red one is a possible one. Okay. If the states are if the rates are time independent, I can easily calculate log, the stationary distribution, I can calculate log P of tau. There is no tau. P of tau is constant in the stationary distribution. And then I can assign to each of these two trajectories, I can <laughs> assign this little S of n of tau. Okay? Now I suppose to state 1 belongs to the entropy point 4, that would be just minus ln P1. To state 2.3, to state 3, 1.2, this would be the value of the stochastic entropy along the yellow trajectory or along the red trajectory. Now, suppose at a certain time you're here. Then the value of this entropy is the same for the yellow trajectory and for the red trajectory. Right? Now, suppose we have the same network, but a different set of rates. We might still find a red trajectory, or have a red trajectory. But of course, this red trajectory, which is the same trajectory as here, will have a different entropy, because it is drawn from a different ensemble. Okay, that's clear. And of course, I should have <coughs> shown you the same picture already. Okay. Now I'm looking. Okay, I think I can do that myself. Yes. The rightmost one. The right one. That that's probably your that's computer. Computer. No. computer. Your computer right thing. The last thing. I guess you can't do it. That's the last part. Oh, okay. no, it's okay. Or no, no. This was just a, this was just a coincidence. It was just a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I Okay. So let's look at the equation of motion first. And it's exactly like yesterday. In cases where these beads are explicitly time dependent, we have this first term. But of course, this value will also change if the trajectory jumps, as you can see here. Whenever the trajectory jumps, the entropy will jump. Okay? And since these are discrete trajectories of uh, the time derivative, the S jumps, so the time derivative involves the delta function. 
And that's just, that the first line is just what we work out. Nj plus is the value after the jump, Nj minus is the value of the n value before the jump. So would I, I yes, please. Please. Is it a, is P, I would have thought P is a functional, or is it a function of n? P, P, P is the, the okay. is it a functional or is it a function? Okay. Pn of r is the solution of the last equation, so it's a function of time and it has three values, p1, p2, p3. Oh, so okay. these are three functions of time. Oh, okay. Okay. If I have a specific trajectory, n of r, this trajectory has values 1, 2, 3, a oh, longer okay. trajectory. I plug that in here. <coughs> Okay. So it's it's not a function, I mean, it's not a function. It's not a function. It's not a function. function. I'm not a, assigning an entropy to the whole path. To the whole path. Okay. Yeah. I'm assigning an entropy, as you can see here, as okay. every point in time. Yeah. At any point, okay. it's like a new entropy. It's really a state function. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Once you calculate an entropy production and look at the change in entropy, that then depends on the entire. No, but we are, we are we're not yet there. Okay. We'll count the left one. Okay. So the first the first line is is, is a trivial mark for such a change, and now I artificially split up this term by adding here this ratio of the rates, little w are the rates, and I have to subtract it. <laughs> Now I remember, now I remember that in this for the mechanically driven case, I have told you that the log of the forward jump divided by the, the jump rate forward process divided by the jump rate backwards process is the change of the entropy of the medium. And for the moment, I just define this part to be the entropy change of the medium. I'm not talking about heat, we're in abstract space, but I just take this as a definition. A consistent generalization of what we have understood for the Longman case. Okay, this is the entropy change of the system, of the network. This is the entropy change of the surroundings, of the medium. System plus surroundings are the universe, so this is the total entropy change. And it's easy now to show that on average, this total entropy change is possible. Okay. Uh, for these stochastic trajectories, we have the same notion of time reversal as we have discussed for the long term case, so I can be brief here. If we have some blue forward trajectory, <coughs> we have some red backwards trajectory, and if we have time dependent waves, we also have to look at the time reversal of these protocol functions. And then, um, as I just said, the ratio between the forward rate, uh, the ratio between the forward rate and the backward rate would be the entropy change of the medium along the forward rate. And, and the condition of the increase of total entropy is general for any type of rates that you plug into the master equation? This is not a condition, this is a result. Yeah. And it holds for any any time dependence of the rates. Yeah. That's easy to show. On the next slide, this either either numerator or denominator and a child in the denominator. Is that the full path or just at the time? That's a full that's a full path and therefore this is a full change of answer along along this. So that is a functional. That is a functional, yes. Delta SM is a functional of the Okay. Um, now, since this is so similar to the Lawson case, you will not be surprised that I can do the same uh, theorems. We will be brief here. So, again, by starting with the normalization of network processes, introducing weights for the forward process, identifying this ratio as the entropy change of the medium. 
uh, we realize that we have this very general result that this non-equilibrium average is one for any function p1 of the endpoint. I apologize, yesterday this was blue in the morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this should be blue. Mm -hmm. By average, you, you multiply what's in there by p0 and 0 and sum. So. I, 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 I mean, that's the way. I have to multiply with the initial probability and I have to propagate that with the full pathway. This would be the full path integral. Equivalent <laughs> of what is this three dynamics. Now there's an infinity of choices uh, of normalized functions here. I want to discuss two very briefly. If you choose the solution of the master equation at this time, this will certainly be a normalized function, well then you get exactly what we have discussed yesterday. Now the statement e to the minus entropy change of the universe is one average. You can also choose as this normalized function a quantity which would be the stationary distribution corresponding to this particular value of the control parameter at the end point. And then you get something uh, which looks like e to the minus r is 1, r is defined in such a way, and it turns out that this is the a-thermal generalization of the Rzhinsky relation. This, this is what in the Rzhinsky case would be the dissipated work. You don't see that that fast, but as a homework problem, you take my notes from yesterday, you just work out for the more general case that this is this corresponds to that. Okay, in the particular case where the rates are time independent and where we already start or wait long enough so that we reach the non equilibrium steady state distribution, we find what I call the detailed fluctuation theory. And uh, this is this symmetry on the probability, this probability distribution to observe a certain negative value of the total entropy production. And again, if you accept all these definitions, this is now a relation which holds for any finite length of the trajectory because that includes both system entropy change and entropy change of the surroundings. Okay. I, mean this, I admit this is a little bit formal. I will now illustrate it with two cases and then we will specialize this to biochemical networks where we, where we have a much better notion of what the entropy change of the environment is. That's actually the heat release in the environment. Okay. Uh, yeah. Isn't there like a minimal condition at least for the rates in the master equation? Like some of them, like none of them have to be zero, for example. Yes, excellent point. Excellent point. This is something I should have stressed. And you can see that here. You run into trouble if one of the rates is zero, <coughs> or if, i.e., you have a transition. There is a fourth state, and you can go only this way, and then there's another network here. Okay. You're not allowed to do that. Whenever you do that, you have infinite entropy change of the media. Now, of course, there are nice models, and we heard, have heard about these models, where you don't have backward processes. Uh, for this, um, you would have to adapt this picture. My claim is, in biology, every process is we don't have irreversible processes in biology. Probabilities may be small, they may be 10 to the minus 40. <laughs> Delta F may be 30 kg, but it's not zero. And therefore, this is consistent. Ben. So basically, that rate would give you a pass over time, or, or a test you would need to do the averaging before you can expect these results to hold. Well, I mean, what, what, what happens here is, at the end, you will end up here. No, no, no I mean, when, when you do have a very weak value yes. reaction, that essentially sets a time scale that means you have average Yes, 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 yes. But whenever that's the case, the statistics becomes really bad. So you said cellular biology, not all biology. You population dynamics keep it tight. But there is a finite probability that the top will appreciate <laughs> <laughs> you don't have the time. No, I don't have the time. I don't have the time. I.e., you don't have the time to uh, get proper statistics on this, on this practice. 
No, that's, that's a fair point. So thank you very much for pointing out this important point. Okay, let me come to my first illustration. Um, this is actually the first paper I wrote in this field. Suppose you have a isomerization. You have a certain number of objects which can be either in state, which can either be in state X or in state Y. The rate, unfortunately, is called K here on this old slide. K going, K1 going from Y to X, K2 going back. And there's total number conservation, so we can move to only the number of X molecules at a certain time. And of course, if the rates are time independent, this is for all practical purposes in the equilibrium system, so look, let's look at the case where one or both rates are time independent through some okay. And then, for any fixed lambda value, I have fixed K1 and K2, and I have spatial distribution, uh, which is this binomial distribution. And the mean value of X molecules in such a stationary state will be given by this point. Now, if you work out um, this relation with the Zark quantity, which I just uh, introduced, you find something which looks a little bit strange. So, the exponent of this time integral non equilibrium average is 1. But this quantity here has a nice interpretation. Here you have to plug in the actual trajectory over which you, over which you have to average at the end. And what enters in the exponent is the difference between the actual number of X molecules at a certain time and the stationary value which you would have if you had kept the rates fixed at this particular value. So what that means is if you change the rate, it takes a while. Suppose, suppose you increase this K1 rate, it takes a while for the system to keep up with that change. And that's, that's what you can call a lag. And we had a very nice talk about the lag uh, two, two days ago. Okay, so this is a statement about this lag, and you can see this will work only if there are some trajectories where the actual trajectory is ahead of uh, what of, of this lag, of what, what it should be, right? Okay, and this is something Chris Zerzinski at the time uh, took up, and uh, if you like this more, you should certainly look at this follow-up paper for some time. Okay, so this, just as a simple illustration, what these quantities, what these quantities um, mean, I would now like to show you the first experiment where this kind of non-thermal uh, non stochastic entropy has been measured. This is something we have kind of looked at in your workshop school. They are specialists on defect centers in diamond. Now, I didn't know anything about defect centers in diamond. You can assume you don't either. This is a certain crystal, and in this crystal are defects, and you can look, and these people can look at a single defect in this crystal using fluorescent techniques. So essentially, what, it, what the defect is, one defect is a combination of two two-level systems. So there is one cycle here, so these are physical level scheme, there is one cycle here which is very fast. This is driven by a green laser, you don't see that state in fluorescent. This cycle is driven by a red laser. So these cycles happen on the nano, nanosecond time scale. And on the millisecond time scale, the defect jumps from this cycle to this cycle. And because this cycle is bright in fluorescent, and this cycle is dark, on the millisecond level, you essentially see a binary trajectory. You either see this object or you don't see it. And here are typical trajectories. Blue ones, so it's either dark or bright, or dark or bright. Of course, you have to modulate one of the rates here. They've modulated the rate from 2 to 1 in a sinusoidal fashion, which just means that you change the intensity of this pumping laser, and the, this intensity is shown here. And now everything is available, and we can just calculate these quantities uh, using the definitions shown on the previous slide. Now, in this case, and there's a lot of information here, and I don't, I don't want to go through everything. Um, what you see in the top panel here, that's the rate, i.e. the intensity of the green laser. The red curve is the average state of the system, and you see very nicely 
of this lag, the, the red curve is behind the green curve. So typical trajectory would be zero here, one here, and so on. This is the entropy change along such a trajectory, because now the rates are time dependent. This entropy changes even if the system remains in the same state. Okay? The medium entropy, this is the red curve, the medium entropy changes only whenever the system jumps. Right to graph. Okay. And here are time traces of these entropies. Red is the entropy of the medium, blue is the entropy of the system. Now we can look at many of these, we can do histograms and so on. Um, we have checked this fluctuation theorem. For this system, periodically driven system, even this detailed fluctuation theorem holds if you choose the length of the trajectory to be proportional to one full cycle. Before you go away, how different are these distributions from Gaussian or the Gaussian? Okay, by no means Gaussian. That's a very good point. I'll show you uh, horizontal distributions on the next slide, but you can see it already here. Um, this, this delta S, you see that in a discrete system, this delta S can only have discrete values. And if you measure the delta S after full cycle, you can only have four values. You can start in one, end up in one, start in one, end up in two, and so on. So this is a this is this has support only at these four discrete points. Um they 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 look up they look out in but they are not. They are definitely they are not. Definitely. Question. Yes. So the green curve, just remind me, the green curve is what you... The green curve is essentially the time dependence of, of the rate, let's say, K1, that's, 2. That's the driving system. Yes. That's, your that's the intensity of the laser. Okay. That's what they, what they change experimentally. So the red curve is... The green is lagging, right? Uh, yeah. Well... The green is lagging. The green is lagging, yeah. But that's just... No, no, no. Mm -hmm. the red is like the red is there. The red is The green has the maximum here, the red has the maximum a little bit later. The red is like yes it's okay. What okay. is the mean the mean value? The the meaning of the red curve is P bar of T. That's the probability to find the system. The experimental probability to find the system at time t in state one. Okay, of course, you can calculate it theoretically, but these are all experimental traces. We have not put in a single theoretical uh, quantity in this in this data and in evaluating this data. This is all experimental. Okay, uh, Uber wanted to see distributions. So this, this R quantity, which, as I said, corresponds to anticipated work, here are probability distributions. And you know, this, this was actually the first experiment we did, and the entropy one was the second one. Um, so they, ca they came at some point, they came with this distribution uh, for this R quantity. Uh, and we thought, well, at first we also thought that should be Gaussian. And then we did the calculation. But the experiments show this kind of structure here. And then we did the calculation, and the blue curve is the theory. The theory distribution has cusps. has even cusps, and here it's more pronounced. But you see that the experiment tries to uh, <coughs> with these cusps. So, I mean, the particular form of this is not important. The message here is, these distributions, and I already made this point yesterday, these distributions as such are very non-universal. And again, this is just one constraint on this whole thing. And we have to understand better what is buried in these distributions. Now, beyond always checking the fluctuation theorem. The fluctuation theorem is a theorem, and it does not need any checks anymore. The only, if you, if you try to look at the system experimentally, what you find at the end is whether or not your system obeys the assumption of the fluctuation theorem. The theorem does not need tests. The theorem is theorem. Was there between A and B? I mean, the two parts A and B? Uh, the difference is the, uh, the, 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 the length of the trajectory. Yes, please. So, sorry, in the experiment, how do you measure the stationary state? I missed that. The NS style. Well, they, you know, they are patient guys. <laughs> they have very, very long trajectories. 
I mean, this is milliseconds here. So what you need, I mean, my experience for decent statistics is you need of the order of 10,000 trajectories at least, or 10,000 pieces of length. And that's why it's so awfully hard to do that with bio with the same size. Yes, sir. You mentioned that the PDFs are not universal. Do you have any yeah. notion that they fall into classes? Well, that's, that's something I really would love to know. Um, and I think the, the, so the question was, do they fall into classes as PDFs? Uh, my hope would be that in the long time limit that the large deviation function I was talking about yesterday, that perhaps for those who find classes. I mean, it's hopeless, it's hopeless to find classes for such objects. I mean, we know where the cusps come from. Right? You know, it would be very difficult to to come up with a reasonable uh, classification of such distributions. So short time, short time behaviors, I think, will be very, very difficult to find universality of all classes. Okay, so much, so much for this general thing. General master equation type of dynamics, and for the rest of the lecture, I would like to focus on this biophysical or biochemical system. Um, here is my theorist cartoon of an enzyme. These are different states, internal states of an enzyme, and whenever the enzyme goes from state N to state M, this could be 120 degrees revolution of this F1 ATPase, or this could be a single step of a denisine uh, photoprotein. Whenever this enzyme goes from state N to state M, there is some chemical reaction going on. Typically, this would be ATP. The ATP is hydrolyzed into ATP plus phosphate. Okay, but for our purposes, there are some small molecules around, and we can write this as a chemical reaction, A1 plus N, with a certain rate, W sub n m goes to m plus a2 plus a3, and vice versa, with a different rate. Okay, so in this business, we now distinguish, distinguish two classes of species. One class is what I call the enzyme. These are big objects where, in principle, we know in which state the enzyme is. The red species are small molecules like ATP or phosphate, which you cannot count in a cell, so you have to specify, you can specify only the concentration of these molecules. And of course, for any given enzyme, there is an equilibrium concentration of these red molecules, but then the enzyme doesn't do any interesting. We want to specify the concentrations of these molecules at non-equilibrium conditions. And I I'm using here the relation between the concentration, which is written here in this biochemist notation. So square brackets means concentration of species A alpha. And for every, any concentration, I can define a chemical potential just in the usual way. You this talk of the concentration, and you see none of that stuff. That, that's what chemists usually do, and for us, we can translate this into an internal energy of um, the species alpha, and then uh, we use the function normalization. But that's that's an Okay. And the question I want to answer, or first I want to ask, is, or ask myself, yesterday we have defined, a, sorry, yes. So, the last time we're running the chemical reaction is basically now we're taking what, what a chemist would write as a chemical reaction and writing it as a <coughs> chemical reaction coupled to a mechanical state. Yes, yes. So, the chemical reaction is A1 going to A2 plus A3, but and that induces a, ch a change in the internal state of the enzyme. And it's coupled to basically a mechanical reaction via the Somehow, I mean, I'm not specifying how, what happens. This, I mean, this could be a mechanical step of a motor protein, but it could also have a conformational change, which could again is something like a mechanical step. Yes. 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 
And so the only thing that you're interested in, in terms of writing the rate equations, is the rate of that mechanical interaction. You don't have to worry about the, the chemistry. I have to worry about the chemistry, yes. I'll show you on the next slide. Question, yes? I have an annoying question. Yes, please. Is there a reason that the enzyme is spelled without a E? <laughs> Okay. You guys it's just it's just German spelling from the is missing here. Oh I apologize for I didn't want to put it. I may even spell it wrong in the public. Um, okay, so let's now come to the question. The question is like yesterday, can we assign a first law interpretation to this chemical reaction? Yesterday I've shown you that along a uh, logical equation we can assign work, changes in work, or work input, heat transfer, and change in internal energy to a single trajectory. So the question I asked was, is there a first law for a single reaction? I tried to find it in the literature. I did not. It was <coughs> kind of surprising. Okay. So to get there, of course, I have to tell you a little bit more about the dynamics, and this is now also addressing your question. So again, this is the reaction. Now, I have to make certain assumptions about these reaction rates. And I make the most innocent assumptions the chemists usually do. I assume that if you double the concentration of this A1 molecule here, this rate will be doubled as well. So I assume what is called mass action molecules. <coughs> so the ratio of these rates depends on the concentrations of these red molecules, and I factor out the concentrations of these molecules. And then I'm left with some bare rate with a superscript. Now the key step is to realize that, suppose I take one enzyme, and I take this A1, A2, or three molecules, I throw everything in water, I put it in a closed box, at some point there will equilibrium will be established. In equilibrium, we know that the ratio of these rates will obey detailed balance and the energy difference is given by the free energy difference. This is what you learn in physical chemistry classes in equilibrium. And the delta G, well, the delta G involves delta mu from these red molecules and it invo involves free energy differences here from the states of the protein. You also know that in equilibrium, the chemical potential is given by the, well, by this relation. And this, this relation holds for any concentration, so it holds in particular for equilibrium. Now you, you use these results, you plug them in there, and what you find is that you can express, that's what we will need, you can express the ratio of these bare rates by this. So the ratio of the spare rates is independent of the concentration of this A of the spare species. Confused, what is omega 3? Is it, what is omega 3? Um, okay. Omega 3 are the normalization factors which you need to transform the concentration into something dimensionless. And this you would have to, I mean, this, this basically is something, um, I mean, in order to calculate this, you have to, you have to have a statistical mechanics model of the A1 molecule. Basically, you need the partition function for the A1 molecule. So this is still a dilute approximation? This is a dilute, and mass action law, kinetics is a dilute approximation. And, <laughs> yes, and assuming, okay, let me, let me say this. And assuming that mm -hmm. such a relation holds, this is the equivalent of what we did for the Langevin equation, where we assumed that the noise and the mobility are still connected by the energy. Mm -hmm. This is the conceptual equivalent of that relation. So I mean, because on the other there's partition functions and equilibrium properties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
Because now these are the rules of the games. And with these rules of the games, which I think are, you know, it's a set of minimal reasonable assumptions, <coughs> we can now answer the question I was posing. Do we have a first law for a single step? Okay, yes, we do. And it's surprisingly simple. What is the word? What is the word we put in? Well, we have to provide these red molecules at certain concentrations. And if one reaction takes place, we have to refill the chemiostats, the reservoirs from which these molecules are taken, to go back to the original. And the word which we put in is chemical word, and that's just the difference of the chemical potentials. Internal energy is the state here, change of the state in the enzyme to each level I have associated such an initial energy. And now I want the first law to hold. So the difference I will tentatively call D. And if you look at the difference and you take it, the equations from the previous slide, you find that this dissipated heat for a single step turns out to be this quantity. It depends strongly on the concentrations and it involves this ratio of the square rate. But for this ratio, I just have given you an expression on the previous slide. If I go back to the beginning of this lecture, I had defined the change of the entropy of the medium as the log of the ratio of the rates. If you work this out, and if you compare this with this, you find that these two quantities are equal, and I have set the temperature of the environment here to know. So this shows that the previous abstract definition is consistent with what you would have if you interpret a single reaction in this first law like fashion. So, we get, so everything is consistent. Okay. Now I have to find it for a single reaction event. I can now certainly sum over all these reaction events and then I can meaningfully speak about the change of the entropy of the system, which would be just involving this green molecule. I could talk about the heat released along a certain trajectory, which would be adding up those contributions over all steps. And yeah, the change in internal energy if the system doesn't end up in the same state as it was when I started the process. Okay, and now you will not be surprised that you can now work out a full okay, well, 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 let me first illustrate it. So. Okay, now here is something very, very trivial. Now in, in formulated in a somewhat complicated fashion. This is this F1 ATPase. If you look from bottom, the key point is how this gamma subunit is oriented. And it turns out that whenever this molecule hybridizes one ATP, this is now running it uh, at high ATP excess, this position of the gamma subunit with respect to the membrane advances 120 degrees. Okay. So what's, and the three states are equivalent. So essentially, we are dealing here with three states. We have a master equation. We can continue that cyclically. And then it turns out that in this abstract expression, you find that the total entropy change is just the number of steps in the forward direction times logarithm of the ratio of the rates. That would be, that would be the abstract definition I've introduced uh, at the beginning of this lecture. Question? Yes. <coughs> you model, you're, you're assuming it's got the same rate to go to each step? Yes, well, I, I assume that I, yeah, because the three states are equivalent in this model, you have the same rates. Right? And therefore, the entropy in the stationary state of the system doesn't change. All probabilities are 1 over 3, so the logarithm of 3 is, doesn't change. And hence, the total entropy change is given only by the change of the entropy of the medium. And for this, we have, we have to look at the ratio of these On the other hand, you could look at this from a physical chemist perspective. And you would say, OK, in each step, an ATP is burned. This molecule does not do any useful work. So the chemical energy of this ATP is just dissipated as heat. How much energy is that? Well, for each step, it's just the difference of the chemical potentials. 
you multiply that with n and you get inequality. So the abstract definition and what you would expect actually agrees. So this is in the station of the state. And we can look at this detailed fluctuation theorem for total entropy production. But since total entropy production is just <coughs> proportional to the number of steps in the forward direction, this detailed fluctuation theorem becomes an expression for the probability to find the molecule going n steps in the wrong direction. And d to the minus total entropy change, well, that shows up. Now, this is something we could, of course, have calculated much more easily. The probability, this is an asymmetric random walk. And for an asymmetric random walk, you can look up the probability p of n was made n steps in time t in Van Kampen's book. It's actually one of the exercises. And it involves Bessel functions. But if you divide p of minus n and p of n, the Bessel functions drop out, and the simple thing remains, which here is actually tiny. OK, so this is a very complicated way of solving the asymmetry. <laughs> OK, so this was the single enzyme. Um, I'd now like to see. Okay. Now, there is one subtlety here, which is also important in a more general context. And let me um, go through this. Yeah. For the time. Suppose I've, I've spoken about what happens if we have one of these enzymes. Suppose we had n of these enzymes. Or suppose we had this enzyme stacked along some macro protein. We would have an n domain protein where each of the domains would have this function. But let's stick to the case where we just have n enzymes of this type. And suppose experimentally you cannot distinguish by which one changes its state. That would be really realistic. Let's see, you have three of them in a, in a, in a controlled volume. Well, you cannot say which one, which one changes the state. OK. Then I have, in principle, the state is characterized by saying in which state is the first molecule and no, sorry. How many of the molecules are in state? One, how many of the molecules are in state? Yeah. And a reaction would be that just one of them goes from n to m, so the number of molecules in state n will decrease the number of molecules of state n will increase. And of course, for physical problems, you would expect that the rates now are the rates for a single molecule, but of course, as we have seen yesterday, you have now multiplied with the number of molecules which can undergo such a transition. So if I take naively the definition that the entropy change of the medium is the log of these rates, I will now find a different expression. This would be the expression for a single molecule, and this would be the expression, uh, an additive term, additional added term, term coming from the fact that I have n of those. But the heat, of course, released in a single step does not care about whether there are other molecules around. So physically, the heat should be still given by the ratio of the small W's. And this looks a little bit inconsistent, and it doesn't, you know, not too much time, but uh, to work out, uh, to see what happens. So the rule of the game has to be changed if you have, quite generally, internal degeneracy. When you have internal degeneracy, you have to even change the definition of the entropy. So you have to redefine the entropy. That's what we had before. That's minus Ln probability. But if each state has some internal degeneracy Gn, you have to assign, on top of this definition, you have to assign an internal energy to each state. If, 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 if these states have internal degrees of freedom, the entropy of the state will change. And this you have to include explicitly. And this is, is a nice example where you can see why you have to do that. Now it turns out that then you also have to modify the definition of the released heat. For each step, 
you now have to subtract these differences of internal entropy. So what you have added to the entropy of the system, you have to subtract for the entropy of the medium. The total entropy doesn't change, and hence all these theorems still hold true. Okay. And this is something which will show up in any model. So this whole description is consistent only if you have, in a sense, resolved the state well enough. As long as the states have internal entropy, you have to add them in the balance. Okay, so this was for one enzyme. You'll not be surprised that you can do that now for a whole chemical reaction network. I will just show you this one slide to introduce you to the problem, and you'll find the answers in a 15-page article in the check paper. So what's the idea? The idea is that we have a certain number of these enzymes, species J, and that we know all the time how many of these enzymes are in state J. And then we have another set of species, the red molecules, and they are provided by reservoirs or by chemistry. And the red and the green molecules undergo reactions of this type, R, P, S, and Q are sectometric coefficients, and we have to assume that at any given time we know how many of the green molecules, so we should have only few of them, are in state J. And then you can generalize what I have done. We get now energy, entropy, chemistry of insulation, everything along a trajectory in such a whole chemical. <laughs> We have the row labels the number of reactions. So we could have different reactions. <coughs> this is a whole reaction method. Now, I would love to show you um, experiments illustrating these ideas, but I'm not aware of them yet. So this is, this is essentially now a, a concept, a framework, with which we can describe, I think, very general biochemical networks using these thermodynamic notions which I have tried uh, to introduce for this mechanical case, but my original motivation was actually doing this for the chemical, uh, for the chemical, for chemical networks. Okay. Uh, as my very last slide, I'd like to come back to this issue of optimization. Last slide, for example. Uh, of this issue of optimization, uh, now for such biological uh, machines, and of course, the primary examples are molecular motors. Um, so the idea is I'm using here this kind of um, wretched potential. So the idea is that we have a molecular motor which lives in some uh, red potential. And transitions between these states are driven by chemical reactions. So the forward transition is given by let's say it's driven by the excess of ATP, so it will be proportional to the concentration of ATP. But of course, the motor has to do useful work, so it has to pull, of, pull against the force. And of course, if that, um, if you have force here, this force will actually uh, decrease this barrier, uh, increase this barrier, sorry. So you have this modification of the rate, which is proportional to the force, times the distance here up to this point, that's the activation value. That's a simple problem. And of course, you have to allow for consistency for backward reactions, so the backward reaction would go in from here to there, and there you have the corresponding factor here, which depends now on the mechanical knowledge. Okay, so now we have um, chemical energy put in, and the, work, and the motor delivers useful work. We, have, we use the concepts introduced on the previous slides, and within such a simple model, you can actually calculate how fast the motor moves, how much work it delivers, or I, how much power it delivers. And that, of course, depends on the concentration difference um, of these uh, species, which you would provide. And, and that was the point of this paper, it also depends on where this activation barrier is. It makes a big difference whether this delta L is here close, is close to zero, so i.e. close to the initial state, or if the potential was that shape where the delta L was at the final point. So for the experts, 
This situation where the delta L is small is typically called a power stroke, and if the delta L almost corresponds <laughs> to what step size, this is what has been called more from a vector. Okay, we were interested in the power and especially in the efficiency of the system at maximum power, so this is the same question we had on Monday, and it turned out that for the efficiency it's actually beneficial to have the state quite close to the initial state, so delta L being small, delta being small to one, and you can now also look at the efficiency as a function of this uh, chemical potential difference, and for zero, you're at equilibrium, and very generally, the efficiency at max power in the linear response regime is one half. That's always the decision very generally. But it now turns out that the efficiency at max power even goes up when you go away from the equilibrium point, so the system becomes more efficient the further you are in non equilibrium. And this was a little bit. Okay, so this just as a teaser to have a look at this paper. You can combine these mechanical concepts with these biochemical concepts, and we now have the machinery to analyze these molecular motors from this kind of uh, thermodynamic perspective. Okay, so what, what has been achieved? Um, I hope I've convinced you <coughs> that you can formulate the first law along single trajectories. Um, we can define entropy along single trajectories in left sense e to the minus delta s plus is one is refinement of the second law. Yesterday we have discussed generalized fluctuation dissipation theorems holding in non-equilibrium. The class of systems you can uh, apply these concepts to is quite large. We've talked about mechanically or flow driven systems, I've spoken about biochemically driven systems, and I even have shown you this quantum uh, system which is optically driven. Now, in a pedagogical lecture set like this one, I've always tried to use the simplest example. I've often emphasized you can do that for many interacting degrees of freedom. So conceptually, this is done practically. Of course, you know, it's hard work to go down these distributions and so on, and you're invited to do that. You can generalize this logical idea also to stochastic field theories like the KPC equation. I was always hoping that somebody would jump into this. Look at the fluctuation theory for the KPC equation. This is something I'm happy to talk about in private because I think it's an, it's an attractive idea. Um, of course, it would be interesting to do these things for quantum systems. I don't know how much Chris said about this. For the Yazinski relation, this is done in a quantum context. Uh, the detailed fluctuation theorem, I'm not aware of any reasonable generalization. The big problem in the first place is to generate a nice nest in quantum mechanics. And then the second one is to have information about the whole trajectories which are without disturbing uh, the system. And I'm sure, or I hope, that some of you have got ideas how they can generalize this to things which they will tell me on the Thank you very much. You can also ask questions for the whole set of questions I thought. I leave some time for general discussion as well. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the KPD equation. Do you have a, any concrete consequence mm -hmm. that you could derive for the rough phase? Oh, okay, okay. So, KPC equation is that you have some height field as a function of the spatial variable and as a function of time. And the KPC equation is <coughs> that this is some surface tension term, and then there is some nonlinearity and some noise. Okay. And now, following the general rules, the change of the entropy of the medium is the integral the time derivative just by a dot. This is h dot times this right hand side. Okay, so this is a boundary term. So what you're left with is something like h dot 
times gradient h squared lambda plus boundary. Now, in 1D, this boundary, you know the stationary distribution, which is exactly given by this boundary term. So in 1D, the total entropy production is given by this integral. So this is now an integral over space, and it's an integral over time, if we now look at the total entropy production. Okay, but the equation is written here with 1D for capital D that are well known. My question is more different from D. Yeah. Okay. So, so for for two D, this 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 is this is still the entropy production of the medium. We don't know the stationary state, but what you have is that this probability distribution has to obey the symmetry. Okay. And this is essentially a three-point function. So what this relation gives you is a relation between three prime functions, six prime functions, nine prime functions, and so on, if you expand these things. So, so this fluctuation theory gives you a constraint among correlation functions. And I thought it would be interesting to work out these consequences of, of this constraint. And to my knowledge, this has not yet been done. I have proposed this in my review a year ago, but um, so far, as far as I can tell, nobody has really picked up on this. Okay, then they are terribly non-local. The terribly non-local, yeah, sure. This is, this is, this is not a tiny problem. And, yes, terribly non-local, yeah. But perhaps you assume some scaling form, you plug it in, you get constraints on... The, I mean, I'm speculating here, not a field theorist, but I'm... hope somebody catches up on this. I mean, whenever I show this to people who have worked on paper Z, like Michael Lessig or Jochen Brook or my old friends, they said, oh, that looks very interesting, but these days we're doing evolutionary models. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it because I'm not a good Other questions? Boys. Uh, I have a comment that may be useful for the students, uh, especially for the when you discuss the series that W one of the W's is zero the other way. Yes. Um, and it's just a you know mnemonic for me to understand why there should be an infinity. Because you have delta S M is equal to infinity. And we mm -hmm. had this discussion, I don't know, five, six years ago. But it may be useful to share with the students. Which is that if you think about equilibrium situation, when could you possibly get an irreversible thing that would be a W one way and not a W the other way? The answer is T equal to zero. But only at T equal to zero can you possibly have a totally asymmetric set of limits. And when you're T equal to zero, you can say, well, T that means I'm coupled to a temperature bath that has T equal to zero. And therefore, no matter how much heat I dump it for, I'm going to be an infinite entropy. Mm -hmm. So that's the way that you know, I think about the mnemonic of how to remember. If you see an infinity, sometimes you should panic and sometimes you should not panic. <laughs> and this is one you should say, well, you know, what the hell, if I couple it to a zero perfect path, then somebody tells you that an entity should be equal. That's the point. Yeah. But otherwise, you get the limit between the small finite temperature which is only an entity. Thank you. Um, Is a bath always necessary for the moving system? In the sense, if I take a completely dynamical system. Okay, okay. So this, uh, that's a, it's, it's a good question. Um, completely dynamical system, this is what's got, what, what Galawati does. So he uses some kind of chaotic dynamics. Uh, and you can, you can prove that, but, but even then he wants to, he wants to couple it. Sorry, even then he wants to couple it to a bath. I mean, if you have a, you see, you, you need to define this, you need to define these quantities. So what is what is the entropy? What is the entropy change? If you if you don't have a bath, you don't have what I would call the entropy change of the medium. So you only have the entropy change of the system. Uh, I, I mean, I would not know how how to prove something in this, in, in this case. 
I mean, you need some, you know, you need some, some, you, you don't, I mean, you need some, you need, you need some steady state distribution, right, which for, for these chaotic systems is this, um, how is this called, this SRB, SRB thing, uh, I mean, this is just really beyond me, so I would, I would refer you to Galavotti's paper or Ruel's paper. I don't, I don't know, but Sinai and Poppy do not work? Uh, I shouldn't say anything. This is not my opinion. I would add one comment. There's one experiment on a dynamic system by Bandy in this group. So they don't have to keep asking the traditional sense. And they look at these fluctuations in it. So what is it? In Bandy's paper, they look at, they look at um, how the colors on the surface with the kind of waves on top, and they look at how the molecules come together. They yes. They look at phase phase contraction. Yes. <laughs> I mean, if, if you have a reasonable definition of entropy, you can, you can at least check whether your system uh, obeys this. And, you know, you could turn it around, so the entropy definition is reasonable if the system obeys the interpretation of the entropy. Okay, thank you.